So we're on Book 3, Sutra 45, which says, By Samyama on the gross and subtle elements and on their essential nature, correlations and purpose, mastery over them is gained. By Samyama on the gross and subtle elements and on their essential nature, correlations and purpose, mastery over them is gained. Okay, and I'm going to switch and see Carrera. And Carrera's translation is slightly different. By virtue of Samyama on ether, vritti activity that is external to the body is experienced. That's, that's 44. That's 44. I'm reading the wrong one, that's why. <laughs> that's the one we read Friday. Yeah. Master, <laughs> mastery over the gross and subtle elements is gained by Samyama on their essential nature, correlations and purpose. Same translation, just switched around. Let's examine this sutra point by point. So, gross and subtle elements. The gross elements are all that we see, touch, smell, hear, and taste. Beneath the level of gross elements is the level of subtle elements. The subtle is the cause of the gross. Essential nature. Subtler than the subtle elements, there is the characteristic essence of a thing, the solidity of a rock, the liquidity of water, the mobility of air, for example. Correlations. Going deeper, we come to the level of the gunas, which are common to all objects. The gunas have an active relationship, a correlation to the above factors. Purpose. Finally, behind all matter, from gross to the most subtle, is the purpose, the why of matter. Why do elements exist at all? And why is there an almost infinite number of objects? Sri Patanjali has told us that matter exists for the sake of the self. By Samyama on the above points, the yogi achieves mastery over matter. I'm not sure that all that explanation really helped me understand. It's 345, right? Yeah. I'm gonna, um, I just pulled up the one from Centering Yoga. Yeah. I'll, I'll read this. The sutra can be understood with an equation of yoga practice, oneness, becoming, master, it, and, and he has a sign or she like equals oneness equals becoming equals mastery equals being. We as creatures of action are immersed in becoming. To realize our role in the divine play of nature is, however, to discover the being that we contain. Our task is to undertake a journey that leads not to yet another quest, but to the journey's ending. Key to unlocking this puzzle is to explore the process of mastering the elements. By elements, Patanjali means any object, be it a physical object, an action, or an idea. Oneness is the tool to this mastery. The reminder the remainder of the sutra describes a progressive ordering of the world from more external to more internal. Most external and easy, most and external and easiest to, tax, to access is the level of stula, the aggregation of an object or experience. Take for example, the crying of a child at the neighboring table of a restaurant where you are immersed in an important discussion. You may feel frustrated by the distraction, but the feeling is not a simple cause and effect reaction. It is made up of many interactions of your present desires, your past experiences with children, and even your reaction to the appearance of the child's parents. 
and how you assume you should behave with regard to child rearing. Patanjali says that we must unweave the cloth of our experiences, examining each thread individually. The complexity of individual experiences composed of the intermixture of Svarupa, the individual forms. In our example, a particular Svarupa may be a memory of how your parents reacted to an instance of your own public misbehavior as a child. Understanding these isolated threads helps us better understand our reaction. Suksma is the subtle form of an experience. Now we take our own memories of parent-child interactions and examine the emotional content of that experience. What is it that we felt as a part of the subcontent of overall memory and experience? And how does it affect our ongoing interpretation of the world? Beneath Suksma lies on via the correlation or inherence of experience. This refers back to the gunas, the psychological tendency, tendencies towards action, reaction, avoidance on past, and truthful acceptance, understanding of the reality of now. Gunas again. <laughs> in every instant, these three gunas find themselves in a balanced dance for dominance. For instance, when the child cries, we may have a deep-seated longing to avoid memories that are stirred, a desire to take charge of the situation, or an ability to see the instance with objectivity. Patanjali is in some way saying to us, learn to see more clearly, open your eyes to the entire entirety, not just to jumbled fragments you think make the whole. If we can do this, we may reach the understanding of artavatva, I think, or purposefulness. Arta means to point out. We begin to see the why of experience. In Patanjali's system, the world is a classroom set to teach us lessons. Our tutelage is part of the process of becoming whole individuals. As we advance through our studies, we untangle our own past. And as we do that, we bring this present, the present into clear focus. When this moment stands alone, separate from past and future, we begin to experience the oneness of being. I love that he said the world is our classroom. Is this? No, it's totally true. Mm -hmm. I just keep forgetting. Yeah. Not only that, but like this week, last week was like a challenging one and I used every yoga tool I had learned and I did the best I could and I'm really proud of myself and it wasn't perfect, but I think back to where I could, where I could be right now. Yeah. And it really is like doing all this work. And even if it's my, like not something I can't maybe understand this sutra perfectly, I think it all makes sense like that. You, and these lessons just, I think this last week, I'm like, why does this keep happening to me? But we know why, like Amanda has told us that we keep getting the lessons until we can learn them. Yeah. I was telling that, like Kyle's been so impossible to deal with. <laughs> Because he fights me on everything. And that's something that I try to like remind myself if I feel like I'm losing my cool, that whatever I do is teaching him to do mm -hmm. in situations. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, ugh, not again. <laughs> yeah. Just to put a little more pressure on you yourself. Yeah, I'm like, dude, take a chill pill. I, I, I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Do we want to read on? Yeah, I guess I'm we gonna, can. I'm not going to read um, Edwin Bryant's. It's pages and pages long, and it's just more confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, 
I'm not going to read that one for this for this one, but we can read on. Yeah, that one gives me like anxiety. I think yeah, six kind of tie. I mean, I know they all tie together, but I think that one. Maybe we read that one. Yeah, he he seems. I think his he bases everything all his his work on so many different um, commentaries, and he brings them all in. That it, I don't know that it, I don't know. I'm not ready to hear all of that. <laughs> yeah, confuse me a bit more. So anyway, three forty six. From that mastery over the elements comes a. Oh, I'm going straight to reading the Carrera one. <laughs> that, I'll switch back. I have the two of them on my Kindle. I'm switching back and forth. Okay. From that comes attainment of anima and other CDs, bodily perfection and the non-obstruction of bodily functions by the influence of the elements. The eight major CDs alluded to here are Anima, to become very small, Mahima, to become very big, Lagima, to become very light, Garima, to become very heavy, Prapti, to reach every, anywhere. Pra, prakamya, prakamya, to achieve all one's desires. Ishtva, ability to create anything. And Vashitva, bash, ability to command and control everything. So that's what we, that's kind of like a summary, I guess, of what we've been looking at for the last few sutras. The different powers. Or cities. Um, th this reads about what Carrara writes. Carrera, not Carrara. I just changed his last name. Yeah, Do you Carrera, want he says bodily perfection and the non-obstruction of bodily functions by the influence of the element. Okay. That would be nice, wouldn't it, to have no obstruction of your bodily function? But that's what we're all talking about when we're talking about the, the headache or the or the body things that were it would be nice to not have any of those anymore. Um I'll read the Carrera and then you read the uh yes, I think for Carrera you just read the second paragraph. The first right, paragraph is this the same. Is what I read, yeah. yeah. The mastery over matter achieved is the pre in the previous sutra is what brings these attainments. In its original form, this sutra only lists three cities, becoming minute bodily perfection and freedom from afflictions caused by the constituents of nature, the gunas. The rest of the list, handed down to tradition, adds references to mental attainments as well. Okay. Go ahead. So here he says, Tata or from that refers to the mastery of Sutra 3.45. So the previous one, right? Mm -hmm. Tanjali now tells us the result of that mastery. He begins by saying that we will attain Pradurbhava, the powers, Animadi. These powers, Anima, power to become minute, um, and he says, etc. all of them, are listed by Carrera as, from tradition, the ability to become very small or large, light or heavy, to reach everywhere, to achieve all desires, to create anything, and to control everything. How are we to approach such a claim? In a suspension of this belief, is a suspension of this belief required? I think not. We simply need to examine more closely the nature of power. In this context, power is a synony synonymy, I can't say it right, for understanding. Vyasa implied in his commentary that the powers over size and gravity, as well as the ability to reach everywhere, are simply extensions of the mastery over the aggregated, the aggregate or stula level of the world. 
Power is not the ability to control, but the freedom from control. Our bodies are still subject to the laws of nature, but we know that our bodies do not compromise our entirety. I think back to the old adage of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We know the real me and others have no ability to harm that part of us. The achievement of desires mentioned by Carrera comes from the understanding of Svarupa. The individual memories and preconceptions that are confused in every present experience. Vyas refers to the power of efficiency. We efficiently achieve our desires because we dis disentangle them from the subconscious pull that confuses what our desires actually are. Fiasa uses the term mastery in place of Carrera's creation of anything. Both refer, refer to the understanding of our individual reactions to each thread that makes up experience and the ability to disengage from unhelpful reactions. We are not magicians pulling rabbits from hats, but self-directed individuals in charge of our own reactions and self-concepts. We create ourselves. Carrera's control of everything is a combination of Viaza sovereignty and capacity of determination. This arises from understanding our psychological makeup in relation to each component of overall experience. We come to understand the why of our own gut reactions, but in terms of their complex relationships with past experiences and how each of those attachments is grounded in longing or avoidance of past and future. Knowing ourselves is the key to controlling our destiny. Kiya Sampad, translated as perfection of body, is covered in more detail in Sutra 3.47. The final component of this aphorism, ta, I don't, this, um, I'm not even gonna try to read the Sanskrit word. It's like super long. <laughs> Reads that the law of the universe is anastalad, which means sa is and tat is that, dharma is law, form and not destroyed. This is not a reference to religious law or to a moral code. Dharma comes from dri meaning uphold, establish support. It is both law, form, and reality. Anibhigatha from a not, a means not, abhi means upon, han is to strike, is the clue to our understanding of this concept. Oh no, my, my laptop is gonna die. We no longer strike upon the real form of experience. If we understand our individual experiences for what we are, we can stop struggling with them and begin to work with them to gain control of them. The law of the universe is not handed down to us from some greater power. It is the oneness that waits for us in every moment. It is our innate capacity of determination, our freedom not to rule, but freedom from being ruled. Grasping this law, we do not gain mastery over the world. Disease, loss, and suffering will still be with us, but are instead released from mastery by the world. We gain the power to determine how we will react to all of life's blessings and trials. There are no magical spells, no free passes from life. There is only the power to become one with life. We are becoming, but we have the power to move towards being. You know, all this makes me think of um, little kids, you know, like how one, once like they fall, they fall and it's like the end of the world, there's tears crying and all that. And like 30 seconds later, it's all fine and dandy and they're laughing or they fight and they hate each other, like really hate each other in that moment. <laughs> and then it's over and they're done. Mm -hmm. Because they're like really being present. Yeah, and I think like that, those examples are, are amazing because like a child will fall and, and acknowledge that it fell and it's hurt and will allow itself to cry. And then it'll release that and then move on. Whereas like for me, I'll like fall, I'll try to show face 
and not let my, like my ego won't let me be vulnerable and cry and I'll shove it down. And then it'll just, that'll just ripple through my day. Like mm -hmm. I'll, I wasn't able to express something. So then I express it meanly. Oh, you know, I'm just like giving an, like, yeah, yeah. It, it just keeps yeah. snowballing like, into something yeah. else. So instead, like, just like if you're feeling ang like the whole idea of the spiritual bypassing and like allowing yourself to feel angry for 30 seconds or five minutes or a whole day and talking about it healthily and then moving on. Yeah. And I think like that shows up in our, in our bodily functions. Like I know when I'm sitting with something, it goes right to my stomach. If I don't share it, I immediately get sick. Yeah. And like, I'm, I have like a pretty healthy system, just like in general, I don't really get issues. So I know when I'm stressed immediately, it shows up. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll feel it in my stomach when I didn't even really realize. Yeah. I'm stressed and my stomach will tell me that I was, and I have to kind of go, Hmm, <laughs> what's going on? That's making me feel this way. But like a child doesn't necessarily have, I mean, it might, if it's carrying from past lives and you believe in that, but like with me, it could just be like one thing that happens now at my 37th year, but then there's layers underneath it that start showing up. Whereas like a child just, it falls and then it just maybe has like one or two layers and it snaps out of it. Whereas like I'll, I'll do something and I'll, the whole thing will unravel. Yeah. And I got to like, that's why we just have to keep dealing with things when they come up. And I am getting a lot better. I mean, Irish background, like we just slide things under the carpet and don't talk about anything. Yeah. Just have a drink. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Luckily, luckily that was not the way, but it was no, <laughs> no communication. Yeah. You don't need to talk about these things. I no, know. Do, oh, my do not show your tears. My mother still tells me till now, like, um, why crying? Yeah. Cut it out. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> yeah, but then we go the opposite way and we cry over everything. Like there has to be balance over it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like we we can't we can't tell ourselves that that would be like spiritual bypassing, I guess. Like in the sense that if you can't always any ever be angry, you can't ever cry. Like we can't say crying isn't tough like did you um tough. did you guys read amanda posted something yesterday i think it was in her story about um being raised in was it a basically a house that doesn't start support a good emotional like um support and how you just go looking for relationships that like when someone's nice to you it's foreign you don't understand it you get you don't even like you're weird I'm walking away and yet instead you keep going towards terrible relationships because that's all you know mm -hmm. it was a whole it was like four slides I think I didn't see it but I, I think it I've seen it play out with with other people in my life you know I've seen you know people who seem to go into the same path over and over make the same mistakes over and over and they have to come to some set realization before they can break the cycle. Well, when I met Pierre, I thought he was weird because he was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Swear. <laughs> but I had spent like six months just being by myself, running on the beach, meditating. So there was a huge shift in me. And, and I was so happy single. Like, and I wanted nothing to do with guys, but it wasn't anger anymore. It was just like, I'm really happy being me. Like, I don't need a guy. And then he shows up and he seemed really weird. <laughs> he was really nice and I wasn't used to nice guys. <laughs> That's fun. Like, what do you want? You gotta want something. <laughs> I'm listening as you're saying um, about kids. And I'm thinking about the kids that in in my classrooms over the years just the last few years because it's been getting more and more over the last few years that kids have significant issues even at five and six years old and it's it's heartbreaking that they have such issues already at that age 
And those kids that do have the behavioral issues are the ones who can't let things go. They already at five or six can't drop it. They can't just be in the moment and let it go. They're still holding a grudge from pre-K. They'll say it to me, you know? No, he, he was mean to me. When? When? What, ha when ha what happened? And he's talking about something that happened in pre-K. They can't let it go. Um, and I had a little boy, I had his little brother this year. And I had his older, I had the older boy several years ago. And, and so he would still come back to the classroom to visit, you know, on a pretty much a daily basis because he was on a behavior plan and he had a one-to-one. -one and when he was needed to take a break, he would come back to my class. That's, that was the plan. He would come back and he would be a helper in my class. Um, and so his little brother was in my class this year. So he would love to come in and be a helper with his little brother. But that particular boy, the first, I would say four months of the school year with him was so, there was so much turmoil going on. He would throw things and hit people and, and he, had, he had such a hard time accepting a compliment. It was like he'd never, he didn't trust it. He didn't trust that when I was being kind that I meant it. And it took about four or five months at the beginning of the school year for him to learn to trust that I meant it and that I was being real and that it was okay to accept a compliment. And so I want you wonder, I wonder what in his short, cause I was, that was, I was his first grade teacher. Uh, I was teaching first grade at the time. So what in his short life had caused him to be, have such a barrier that he couldn't accept a compliment. He couldn't take something nice. And he had a good heart. When someone else was suffering, he felt it. You know, if he, if he and usually if someone was suffering because of something he'd done, but when he was able to be calm, he felt it and he apologized and he meant it. And he, like, he, he just had no self-control. And like, what causes somebody at that age to already, to already have all those samskaras, you know? He I had all that built up. Kyle struggles with that stuff. And it's like, they're being raised in the same household. And if anything, I was a better mom by the time he came around because I had already gone through stuff with Catherine. And she doesn't have that, and he does. Right. Right. And he'll bring up stuff like, last month when she said, and I'm like, and I last guess. year, and I'm like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So um, I it's, don't, it's I don't, insane. It's mind boggling. And, and then I also I compare myself to my brothers too. My brother and I are eleven months apart, and we're the way we deal with life. I mean, we could not be more opposites. And then my younger brother is nine years younger than me, and they call us the pea in the pod because we react to everything in the same manner. And it's, it makes no sense. You know, he came nine years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's so it's some, there's nurture, but there's also, I don't know, whatever we come with <laughs> somehow. Definitely. Absolutely. There's definitely, yeah. That's why I feel like I have to believe in this idea of, carrying things from my niece is the same way she well she has this like and she's 11 she has this anxiety about her and the panic attacks and my I mean she is like if you're gonna describe a perfect family this is them and then the, there's a four-year-old uh her sister's four years younger and it's like she has to want for nothing and like the, god forbid she got in trouble and like she never gets in trouble but if right. she does, it's not like a big deal. It's like, you it's know. Like she puts pressure on herself, maybe. Oh my God, the pressure she puts on herself. And like, I don't, it's like not like, I, we're trying to teach her like work hard, play harder. Like this, you know, like you don't have to get like, but like, where did she get that from? No one did that to her. 
Right. That's that's right. my Catherine. Right. I mean, there's no, <laughs> you're not putting perfection on them. Some kids just put it on themselves. I know I've seen it. I, definitely people bring, I mean, it comes from, when you meet parents, after you've met the kid and you get to know the kid and then you meet the parents and you, there's usually something there in the parents that is, is connected. There's usually something. Um, you know, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and it's most often true. Um, oh, but it shows up in both parents, but the parents don't act this way to the child. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know parents are very smart. I think her, I think it's Eric's brother. And he was like, if not valedictorian, salutatorian of both high school. And, you know, like they're both like, they have their PhDs, you know, they're very successful. Right. And, but they don't treat Kayla this way. And like, I've seen her do it. She gets on the phone and she does her meditation app and she calms herself down. Oh, wow. Really cute. Yeah. She gets overwhelmed a little bit. So, and, and okay, Melissa does practice yoga, so she can, and so now Kayla practices yoga. That's but, great. To start her at that age so that she'll have those tools is just wonderful. Yeah. I think, I think we're seeing it in kids more and more and more. I think it's the world that we're living in, the speed of the world that we're living in, and the demands that are being put on children younger and younger and younger. I mean, there's demands put on children in elementary school, academic demands and things put on children that weren't put on us. Or, or me, I mean, I'm a different generation from you, Pam, but even you, it's just, it's a different, it's a different paced world. And so the byproduct of that is that we're seeing much, much more anxiety in children. I mean, statistics that I've been reading recently is that 47% of children will be diagnosed with a mental illness by the time they've finished high school. 47%. That's terrible. Yeah. It's awful. Well, it's going so untreated. How are we supposed to cure and, you know, work through those some scars? They're just going to keep carrying it through. Right. One generation after the other. More and more and more by the way that we, by the way that we're schooling, by the way that the, the world... Well, the world's not going to change. It's only going to get faster and faster. It's not changing with all the technology and all the, you know, things that are happening. But that's what this program that I've been studying that we're going to be starting in September, this Choose Love program, is trying to 7%. support that and trying to have kids learn at a very early age to acknowledge not just feelings, but to, to know that they can change things. They have the power in, the, in themselves to change an angry thought to a loving thought and of, of what forgiveness is, which is a huge part of this. Gratitude and forgiveness are a huge part of this program, which are not easy things to instill, but um, I'm really very hopeful that, I'm very, very hopeful that if the whole building, if the whole building, the whole district really puts effort into this program and really does it the way it's supposed to. I mean, I don't know if that'll happen because a lot of teachers will go, oh, I can't take I can't take on another thing, you know, I can't, this is another thing we have to teach. But I just feel like if we don't teach this first, yeah, we don't make this our priority, then the rest of it's pointless. Yeah. This has to be the priority. Mm -hmm. And even like, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, Emotional well-being has to be in place before you start to teach the other stuff. Otherwise, kids aren't going to learn it anyway. They're not going to learn if they're not in a place of safety. So I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I think it's a really beautifully um, developed program. And it was developed, I don't know if I said it to this group already, but it was developed by a woman who lost her son in the Sandy Hook. Mm. He was murdered in that shooting and... She's developed this program since then. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. When you listen to, talk, listen to her talk about forgiveness, oh my goodness. <laughs> do, do you know that was the same, the same night, wait, the night, the day, I think the day before, I posted something, I posted a quote and it was from that program. And, then, and you had just started that program that week. Remember? It's, that's right. 
about fear, about anger. About I don't fear. even remember what it was, but I did like the whole Dharma talk was based yeah. on that all week for the, yeah. for the classes I was teaching. It's they, and actually one of the experiments, one of the one of the modules uh, showed that experiment that you know Amanda talks about the uh, experiment about the atoms that they behave differently when they're being observed. Um, there's an experiment that one guy talks about and he recreates it kind of maybe not completely scientifically creates it, but he creates this experiment where he cooks rice and puts it into three identical jars and labels one jar love, the other hate and the third one ignore. And then he spends, I don't remember how many minutes and for how many days, but each day he spends time, holding the jar and speaking to it with love or with hate or completely ignoring it, right? So he, he does this for, um, I think it's like a couple of weeks. And then he opens the jar and show, shows us the results. So in the jar that he spoke to lovingly, the rice has kind of changed color a little bit, gone a little yellow, but still looks fine. And the jar that he's spoken to with hateful words is all covered in mold no. and the jar that and it was three identical jars and the jar that was ignore has some mold in it and he said this experiment was recreated copying an experiment that's been done multiple times and the same results happen every time he said but in those ones the ignore actually is the worst so in his one he doesn't know why it came out the way it did but it was just amazing to me to and it's rice. The, the, it's rice. The <laughs> effect that on matter, the effect on the atoms of this matter from the energy that he gave it with his words. There's, um, there's a, this science guy. Well, he's a chemistry guy. He used to work for NASA and he quit and now he just does YouTube videos. I'm not going to remember his name. I have to ask my kids, but um, we watch him and he has one wait no i'm mixing people no this is a magician guy but he does the the power of words and he does this stuff like we where he has water in a cup and he's using positive words and then with negative words it just explodes out i like he has like six different things that he does and it's just using words wow positive or negative words wow and it was he did like with a kids different ages to it and it, it's called the power of words that's amazing and like in that sutra what, what one of the ones that you were explaining they, they use that quote that we people used to say sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me but that's not true <laughs> it's not true obviously i mean we we know that i mean in that the explanation they were using that in the explanation to say you know words don't hurt us because that's not us we, we have you no know, there's a deeper self that's not who you are your body or your but after a while you break in our in our human form in our bodily form words do affect us i know we can say when we know more because we're studying we can say okay that's not me that's not you know, this, this isn't me, that me is, is this, you know, the true self. And that's not them either, that they're not being their true self when they're saying those things. I know we can get, but you've got to get past, you've got to do all the work and all the thinking to get past the fact that words do hurt. And you can always, even but I feel the, at least. Energy that comes from the words, because that's what it was with the rice. It wasn't just the words that, that caused the change in the rice. It was the, energy that he was passing into it i believe you know i said this to the rest of my family and they all went oh but no and it's like i'll show you the, like watch the video no i don't want to they don't, they're not buying it they don't want they don't want to hear it they don't want to know it like, and even even when you've done all the work sometimes it's words can still seriously hurt yeah. Maybe maybe there's a higher percentage of being able to just let it go, you know, just go over. Being able to think through it, being able to, you know, process 
where it came from, why it shouldn't hurt you, letting it go, letting it kind of slide off you. There's all that work that we can do to process it. Yeah. <sighs> but I think it's like what you're saying, Jackie, though, with the energy, like the prana, it's not the word that's hurting you. It's the prana the person is sharing with you. Right. Whether or not you're near each other, but you can feel it even through the computer, like when someone's right. hurtful. Yes. So yes. It's and it, it's, the, it's the vibration that's hurting. Yeah. And it's physically hurting you because it's actually physically doing something to you. Right. Right. It's not necessarily like, the word, but it's that everything that's around it. Right. I mean, I remember, I think there's something interesting that Shay and I have we've been married for a long time. Um, we've been together a long time. We don't say hurtful things to each other. Um, I'm not saying we've never had an argument, but... And we never said that, you know, we never said way back or anything that we're not going to say hurtful things. We just don't. And I realized that we don't, because I'm listening to, you know, I was, my sister went through a very horrible divorce a few years ago. Um, but all through her marriage, when she would call me, when she'd had a fight with her husband, the hurtful things they said to each other. And I just kept thinking, and all, I would just listen. I wouldn't say anything because you can't say anything to my sister. You can't give her advice. I would just be a listening person. But I would think, how is this relationship going to survive when they can say, I know it's in anger, but even in anger, how they can, when they can say such hurtful, awful things to each other and then apologize when they, when they would come back around and they would make up. But it was all the time that, you know, these things would happen. I kept thinking, this, how can this marriage survive? And why would you want to live like that? In, in a relationship where hurt, really hurtful things are being said in anger, in those moments of anger. I just, just swap constant. It's gotta be like, what's that doing to It gives the soul? a feeling, and if you're not feeling anything, especially positive, if you're just feeling something, it's something. Oh, gosh. I lived through that marriage with my ex. Really? Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> so I had glad. zero self-esteem. I believe that my thighs were fat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I was 20, this was, I was, I left when I was 25 or 26. So, you know, I was 20 years younger than now and I'm like all skin and bone. So I certainly was not fat, but I really believe that my thighs were fat. Because he used to make comments and tell me that I should go in a tanning, get tanned because my, my thighs look fat when they're white. And I believed it. Like, I fully believed it. Jesus. <laughs> so that's the power of words right there. Yeah. Like, now I look back and I'm like, dear God, like, I know I wasn't fat. I'm not fat now. I wasn't fat then. I, I have anything, I looked better. <laughs> it's not his place to talk to you that way. Huh? Even if you were, it's not right. his point. It's not his point. And, and, and even if I wear, like, even if I wear, because where I am today, I would never, ever now allow anyone to do that to me over and over and over again. Maybe one time and then talk about it and give the person a second chance, but I will not allow you to do that again and again and again. So that shows the, you know, how, I, I had nothing right. in me, nothing, no fight, no nothing. I just took it all. <laughs> all right, well, it's 824. <laughs> I'm not good at track. This is the, I'm not good at keeping track of time. All right, um, let's find a nice, comfortable place to sit. And take a full deep breath in and release it. Maybe sigh it out the mouth. And we'll do some alternate nostril breathing using the right hand, the right thumb to close off the right nostril. 
and the ring finger to close out the left. Take a close the right and take a breath in through the left nostril. Close both. Exhale out the right. Inhale right. Close both. Exhale left. That's one full round. We'll take five rounds together and then we'll take as many rounds as you need to yourself before we go into our meditation practice. Inhaling left. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale right. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale right. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close both. Exhale left. Carrying on at your own pace. Finishing with an exhale through the left nostril. Moving into your practice, I'll set the timer for 20 minutes.
Gently bringing yourself back to the space, to the room, bringing your hands to your heart. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Pam. I hope you feel better. Yeah, feel better. Thanks. I might not. We might camp in the backyard tonight and then bike at 7 a.m. So I'll text Ashley, though, to let her know for sure. Okay. They all have their logins? Because I can always start it. Yeah, I gave... Jackie has her login. But hold on. When you gave me... When you sent me... Hold on. Let me stop the recording. Yeah.